The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. G'day, Clayton here from Ensemble. Thanks for joining me for this podcast. It's a pleasure to be able to do this from time to time. Hopefully you enjoy. If you're not already on Ensemble, please go to Ensemble.com or find us in the App Store. This podcast is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Imagine a world where you can offer clients access to local and international investments. A world where you can engage with clients meaningfully, backed by powerful data and insights with mobile-friendly technology. A world where you can build business efficiencies through scaled managed accounts and bulk reporting. And a world where you can get all the latest news, research and insights to spot the changes that really matter. Wealth is more than just money. It's about opportunity and progress. A world of opportunity awaits you at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. G'day, how's it going? What do you know? Strike a light. Clayton here from Ensemble with the one and only chairman of the board, occasionally Chairman Mao, Andrew Rocks. Thank you for coming on the podcast, mate. What a horrible introduction, Clayton. But I'll uh, I'll take I'll take the intent and I'll pick out the delivery. So no, it's been um, I'm actually really looking forward to not only chatting with you now, but uh, what comes next. So um, thank you. Yeah, correct. Yeah. So which which is really like the purpose of this um, podcast. Uh, you know, we met on a podcast many moons ago, um, and yeah, this is going back maybe four years or so, and. Obviously, it, there's a lot that's happened between now, uh, then and now, and your influence over this company has been quite substantial, uh, and and a number of other companies, um, including Lydian and and your and and VBP, and you're sort of the, the man with a with a million fingers and a million pies, the uh, the alchemist, some say, and um, and I'm really excited to have you are uh, you know hosting a series which we're extremely uh, stoked to to have you on for and this is all about uh it's the engine room podcast right well i mean you're probably best place to to explain it because you're hosting it um but let's jump in why do you think that this is relevant to where ensemble is now considering you know, certainly in the last three years, we've we've grown a lot. So, wh- why why now, and why are we doing a podcast all or called the the Engine Room? Thanks, Clay, and um, and I do vividly remember that that podcast in uh, two thousand and seventeen or eighteen, and um, uh, it was actually pre Royal Commission, um, and so it was was fun times, fun times. But um, why are we doing it now? When an outsider looking in ensemble, ensemble's motto. Um, or ethos is to uh, promote the positive evolution of financial advice. Now you can take that a few ways, and I think the sort of the way in which it's been taken up to now is promote the positive evolution of the financial advisor. Yeah. But a financial advisor does not operate in a vacuum. Okay. Yeah. So what we're you know acknowledging and 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 really uh, lifting the lid on is um, we want to promote the positive evolution of financial advice and advice practices because without healthy, sustainable, positive environments, you can't promote the positive evolution for the advice professional. So um, I know this doesn't come as a big surprise to people listening that behind every advisor is uh, significantly more talented and, and more voluminous people to help your clients achieve their objectives. And there's probably a few silent nods right now as, as you're listening. Um, but I wanted to really highlight that, um, we are an ecosystem and that was, that was the, uh, um, the purpose of it. The other thing is that as businesses change, so, um, you know, I have been involved in this industry as a, as a, an advisor for many years. And for those of you who don't know me, I actually, um, was a CFP for about sort of 15, 20 years. So, um, the practitioner, um, really is as strong as their team. Okay. And there has been an evolution. An evolution in the way in which businesses look. 
um, you know, 10 years ago, a lot of businesses were sole practitioners with um, potentially, uh, you know, three people in the office. Each one of those people kind of just did what it took to do the business. They then evolved into exactly that same format. And then they found someone who was a para planner who basically um, uh, went and did a para planning course and that worked really well. Um, but now I would say the avatar of the type of business in financial services in this country really is as a multi AR business. So most practices are at two, three, four uh, advisors. Um, uh, most practices have listened to really good advice and, and a part of this podcast series going to be talking to the people who give the advice, you know, the business coaches, the, the successful um, people inside licensees, et cetera. And a, a big part of that advice was to price correctly, was to move feed for service, et cetera. So those four um, advisors or three to four advisors generally have a team around them. Um, and those team, that team, um, you know, they have dedicated roles or emerging. They have para planners, so either in-house or external. They have um, administration in-house or external. And a lot of them are using consultants, particularly if they've got their own AFSL, um, both in compliance. Um, there's a lot of investment management consulting going on, a lot of SMAs, MTAs. So the business itself is not the one-man band. And the most important person in the room, the advisors are, are the most important person in the room when the client's in the room. But if I was to be honest and uh, grab, grab each practice and put them in the room, quite possibly the most important in the room, person in the room now is the practice manager, the general manager, the COO, okay? They're the people that provide the environment to allow the advisors to do what they do in front of the clients. They've had very little airplay in our industry. It's, it's actually horrifying in my eyes that I would say the key decision makers inside the practices that make the decisions. And those decisions aren't just what type of clients they could be around to, what platforms they use, what software they use. So for all of you listening who are in the supply side, they're pretty important people. So I thought, why not give them a voice? That was the reason why, Clayton. Yeah, it's um, I, I I feel I feel a little attacked, Roxy, because when you said ten years ago the average advisor was or the average practice was one guy that did everything and then slowly brought on a para planner and then and and then you know slowly brought on a couple of other roles and I thought, mate, are you just purposely having a dig at my exact form of business because that's precisely uh, how I grew it and and there was something. There's something kind of, there is something really comforting about, about that kind of business model because you, you're you saying, hey, I know that I can hit, let's call it five or six, maybe $700,000 a year, right? Like I'm pretty comf uh, like confident that, um, that that is achievable and, 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 and looking at sort of my fixed costs and I, I can sustainably see a, a, a moderate growth rate to make it all interesting for for us over the over the long term. Um, and yet, in the time since I launched my original financial planning business ten years ago, um, we have begun to see more and more of these more highly sophisticated companies. And if I was if I was still practicing. I, I still do think that there is a place for the the smaller advice practice, especially if someone wants to always give advice, right? It, it, because oftentimes when people grow grow practices, they end up not being face to face with the client. And um, and I think for those that choose to stay in that situation, uh, it totally makes sense. Um, but do I think? that even those that choose to stay in a small practice can learn from the people who spend their life in larger practices that are working on the efficiencies that are working on, you know, how to, to, to deliver best practice. I do let alone the advisors that want to actually become those bigger, more sophisticated, um, outfits anyway. So, so basically I'm, pretty excited that we're building this podcast series the engine room because the audience that you're mentioning it is typically the hardest to get in terms of guests on a podcast 
uh, because they are they 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 are already in a position where where every micro decision you know it is is extraordinarily well thought out and that they, they've become you know that they, they've built the engine room so to speak and so I'm pumped to have this uh, this sort of um, list of guests that we've got coming up because I think everyone can learn from them from from, from the smallest practice through to to ones that are already growing. Yeah, look, I think Clayton, you've um, you, you've nailed it there. That's the reason we're doing this this podcast because there's no right. Okay, you could you can run the business that you've just mentioned, and you can be very lean. You can be hyper targeted. I mean, there are practitioners out there that just do. Um, you know, UK pensions that just do self money. You can be hyper targeted, and and we're still we're still grappling with the the evolution of our of our profession, where it's sort of circa thirty years old. But you know, if you're getting medical treatment, you go to your GP, let's call them, and then they refer to a myriad of people who work with you, okay, mm-hmm. to achieve your goals. So um, even those smaller practices, no doubt, are working with people. Um, but the um, it's got got a bit to learn. The other thing is. The life cycle of an advisor. So I actually took the liberty, and I'm going to get this wrong for all you tech heads out there, of going into our data pond, no, data lake, okay, <laughs> just recently, and finding out the body of water. <laughs> yes, that's right, and finding out the average age of the ensemble cohort. And no surprises there, given that we are, um, be, you know, emerging as the majority of the industry, um, yeah, it's about that 47, 46, 47 years old. Yeah. So um, it's a life stage thing as well. Um, and once your kids are in um, high school and you're in that sort of zone, for all of those people listening who've been through it, it goes fast. You go from being someone who's very happy to have a lifestyle business to actually going, wow, I actually need to have a succession plan. So um, what we're hoping to do to, to, during this, the course of, of, of showcasing these businesses is showcasing all the models. Okay. There's no right or wrong. Okay. There's no winner. There's no loser. Um, We're showcasing the models and we're hoping that by doing that, you'll be able to build your own rich tapestry yourself or identify really awesome people that you want to be part of in your life. And the great thing is that geography doesn't really stop us anymore. So um, yeah, that's, that's the plan. Massively true. Um, Who uh, are there? Is there anyone that we can talk about in terms of names that that we're, we've got lined up already? Uh, like the who, who is coming on? Uh, and you don't need to go into specifics if you if you can't yet. But yeah, what who are the types of guests that we can expect to be listening to? Okay, so um, obviously, what I wanted to do was get a rich tapestry of guests. So I'm not going to mention exactly the practices or the names because some of them are yet to record their podcast um, and I wanted to sneak up on them. Um, but we have practices that are um, that are, are, are single operators. We have practices that are multi-location. We've got practices that turn over a million dollars. We've got practices that turn over $100 million. Oh, yeah. We've got practices that have over 100 employees. We've got some that have got 200 employees. None of these are owned by the banks. Wow. We've got practices that are multidisciplined, that are part of um, accounting, um, mortgage broking, um, multidisciplinary in businesses. We've also got practices who work in with other practices. Mm. So where they become specialists in a particular niche in financial planning yeah. and their clients are other financial planners. So I wanted to really have that broad reach of them. We've got practices that are at their the beginning of their growth cycle. We've got practices that have just done mergers and acquisitions. Um, you know what? I've even got some practices that have taken some money off the table and how they did it. And some have did it well and some did it poorly. So what we're doing now is we're going to give the perspective from the practice manager or the general manager. The successful practices of the future are no longer um, dominated by ownership by the advisors. Um, every clever business that's inverted commas attempted to corporatize would no doubt have offered their their COO or their general manager equity, either in an ESOP or a buy-in, um, and their head of operations. And and you'll find these themes are quite are quite a big part of it. And in fact, whilst I'm sort of rabbling on there, I just wanted to give you know a, a, an ethos or a format that served me well um, throughout my career. Um, and it's breaking so almost every conversation into four quadrants. And I will be doing that in in relation to this these conversations. 
The first one is the quadrants are people, strategy, execution, and cash. Okay. Now, lots of people have heard that, but what I'm really curious is how successful practices have organized their people yeah. from, an, from an org chart, how they've transitioned potentially from a small business to having a board, potentially even even other investment, um, how they how they've managed to grow people from um, administration into power planning, how they've navigated the PY. I know that Ensemble's got a great PY program at the moment, but it's really only coming in uh, recently, and it's awesome. But you know what the intention is to grow these the, the, these people through, and then how do you run culture? And I'm not just I'm going to dig deep on culture. Culture is not a throwaway line. Culture is not ping pong no. tables. You know, no. there's a, there's a way of doing things around here that that is that that really the people generate it. The strategy. Now, people think strategy and financial planning. They think, what's the strategy of the advice? No, no. What's the strategy of delivering the advice? Yes. That could be something like, do we have a, a shared services? Do we have a pod system? You know, I'm not going to say what I think is right or wrong, but throughout you're going to you, throughout the listeners are going to be able to hear and work out what works for them. And in many respects, it comes down to their personalities. So the great thing about being married is you don't marry yourself. So quite often you'll have left brain people married to right brain people. You'll have detailed people in, a, in an organization and you'll have flamboyant people. And when you're a multi-AR practice, it is almost impossible for all of you to be the same. So not only does the practice manager have to put down a, a sort of a, a rigor around a process and a system, but then they've got to figure out the foibles of the individual ARs. And for those of you guys who are laughing and girls who are laughing at the moment, yes, I'm talking about you and the fact you like doing things special and, and your practice manager and you're killing them slowly every day, but they need to work with you. So, and then finally the execution, you know, we are going to talk to a, a, a lot of advisors who advise practices and, and their biggest bugbear is that they give great strategic advice, but not every practice executes. And that could be a priority. It could be an authority. You know, are you a practice where your uh, advisors um, say that they defer to their operations team and whatnot, but when push comes to shove, they want to put their fingers back into the operations every second minute? Well, I can tell you, with, with circa 4% unemployment rate, you have a problem. Like, so the biggest part of it is, and then finally cash, you know, so once I've done that, um, you know what? It is fun making profit and it's not a bad word. Okay. God, no. We, we have, we have graduated from occurring earnings multiples and we're now all about multiples of EBITDA or, or yep. in layman's terms, how much profit do you make? And, yep. and if I was to buy you, how many years worth of that profit would I pay you now for you to give me the keys to your car so that I can make profit thereafter. Yeah. And the great thing about that is for everyone who really loves their clients, anyone who buys a business on that principle really needs to keep them for at least the multiple period and then some. So your clients will be really well looked after or else the person coming in is, 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 is conducting financial suicide. So um, then there's other things. So, you know, what's the level of transparency? So if you're asking your operations team to trust you do you trust them do you disclose what you're making what the profit is what the targets are or are you a closed book very interesting and then finally we we will ultimately wrap it up at the end on who is a good practice um there's there's several metrics around and there's a great place to work and i know that quite a few of the practices you'll be happy to know clayton have actually polled in the top 100 um, great places to work in Australia that I'll be interviewing. So we are going to get some sort of North stars perceivably involved as well. Wow. That, um, yeah, it's, it's quite interesting to see the growth of the podcast because typically over the last sort of five, six years that we've been running this uh, podcast for now, it started with, I mean, we're in the middle of an episode right now, which is, which we which has traditionally been the backbone of, of the of the podcast channel. And it was a very free-flowing conversational set where it's always just been centered around what can I start doing in my advice delivery today after listening to the podcast? That's all, that's kind of always guided. And over the last, I'd say, maybe year, year and a bit, we've been branching off into almost like different shows and different 
And the way that we're kind of approaching the podcast now is less about it being one show on on one podcast channel. But now we're looking at multiple different shows across the the singular podcast channel. And so this engine room podcast is it from from our point of view is something that it's a show that's very much dedicated to high level experienced uh, operators who who aren't so much looking for um, how you know how best to talk about an advice journey with a client. It's more about um, well, how can I get all of the team, no matter how big it is, from 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 five people to a hundred people, to operate in a fashion where we become more than just financial planners, where we become sort of, um, and, and it's kind of interesting, if you think about the legal profession or accounting, they've, they've for a long time had these sort of, you know, business models that were based around partnerships and and it was very clear for, they've got a, career, a clear career path for, for new um, professionals and they work their way up and it, in financial planning, it's always been this goodness, this maze of opportunity that you have to find your way through uh, to arrive at a position that makes sense for you. Um, but oftentimes, it kind of arrives at a point that's almost predictable. And the thing that I like about what what we're discussing right now is over the last 10 years, we have seen great practices emerge. And I'm excited that we're now going to get the opportunity on a weekly basis to dive in, pull those pieces out, and really use it as as a guiding light to, well, this is best practice on how to grow the business of advice. Absolutely, Clayton. And when when um, I decided to um, get involved with the XY, now called Ensemble, um, a driving motivator for me was that um, in the 90s, I would have loved to have had this community. Mm. Um, not because um, uh, it, 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 it will have told me all the good things to do, but importantly, it would have fast forwarded my mistakes. Yeah. You know, um, and, and that's that's what's going to happen here. I mean, we're going to go right into the granular. We'll be talking, there will be details. We'll be talking about, you know, what makes a good AFSL partner? What makes, what makes good consultants? What's a decent tech stack? What's fantasy? What's folly? You know, what makes in good employment arrangements? What makes good HR? What makes good power planning? Um, and with my background um, and what I'm doing currently, I get to see probably more practices across more licenses than any other person in this country. And <laughs> it all enables me to actually glean that information, which is going to become very useful when I'm interviewing these people. Um, the other facet of it is is that when you're talking about um, people, you can't leverage a founder's vision without leverage. There you go. That's a double leverage. But um, you need to be able to work in a team. And I think Deloitte came out. I think I read the AFR. I was obviously bored over Christmas. Um, hi, hi, wife and family. Sorry about that one. <laughs> um, but uh, Deloitte's come out saying, yet again, predictably, the biggest test for CEOs this year globally is going to be a talent shortage. Okay, so we started percolating this um, this because of our passion that we previously mentioned, but now um, this is a blood sport. Um, there is no talent. There is no talent. Um, no or is there? Talent. Or is there? Or is there? Why do the best practices still have resume after resume, people wanting to be there? What is it about yeah, wow. them? And if you are one of them, yes, you can smugly keep driving along, okay? But if you're not one of them, and hopefully I can build a bit of a Rosetta Stone for you to figure out what they're doing and why they're doing it. We all know in financial planning, it's a massive, massive market. We're not competitors. In the spirit of Ensemble, I want to be able to glean and impart as much of that information so you can become an employer of choice. Because when we're actually getting down to the operations of financial planning, you're not competing against other financial planning firms. If you've got a team member who's in operations, well, they... they they can, they might have come from another industry and they can go to another industry. So not only do you have to be good at financial services, but you just have to be a damn good employer, a damn good mm -hmm. partner, 
You need to create mm. genuine blue sky and create an environment, whether it be flexible or not, I'm, I'm sure that topic will come up, um, that means people want to work for you on a discretionary basis. Okay. Yeah. And if we do that, Clayton, then I think we've um, promoted the positive evolution of financial advice, advisors and advice practices, mate. Yeah. And, I, and you're exactly right. The I often think, you know, this this concept of the talent shortage, is it, and you've, you've been hiring people for a long time, so this is probably a question to you. Have you found that there's a shortage of talent these days or have you found that the expectations of what it, of what pe- what employers are looking for has increased? Um, both. Now, oh, that's an interesting one. You know, as as you intimated, I had an advice practice for many years, and um, yeah. um, and I was fortunate enough um to get an accolade, the healthiest employer in Australia, and 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 I saw that as first of all a great thing to do. Um, but um, it what what employees want, and this is nothing to do with generations. I'm sick and tired of. People saying millennials, Gen Y. No, it's always the same. Money is not the driving factor. It is one of those factors. What environment do you have? What purpose do you have? Do you have a charitable? Do you have a charitable or a giving nature? You know, what is your intent as a business? How do you treat your clients when they're not in the room? All of these things matter. Okay. Now we we probably won't be asking that last question in the podcast, but I think you'll be able to figure it out, right? So, so um, no, those have never changed, Clayton. Um, what has changed, though, is that um, a COVID has brought forward um, the, or it's just, just completely um, demolished the tyranny of distance for people staying or leaving from a business. Um, I know really quality practices out in the regions, and I will be getting around to them. Um, and, you know, historically, and I was one of those blokes, I I, I Grew up in a country town and left to go to the city, right? And that was the way it was. So you had the, oh, I hasten to say, the brain drain, but, but you know, I left. But um, so um, you had that talent shortage and they were always struggling. Present company excluded. Correct. <laughs> but now you can live in cracking places. I mean, I was at Tamworth on the weekend, Country Music Week. There you go. And a um, couple of really quality um, advice practices in Tamworth. Um, people oh, yeah. can live there, have a great cosmopolitan lifestyle, buy the house of their dreams and do things and they can get clients from other places. So COVID has accelerated the ability to people to leave and find a better place. That's a super interesting, super interesting point. I think on the flip side, from the employer's point of view, um, I, yeah, it's it, it it's so true what you're saying. I think there's, pro, there's pros and cons. I think from an employee's point of view, if I'm looking for a job, I, I can expand beyond my geographical region to 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 be employed, and I think that's a huge uh, positive and a huge benefit as, as an employee. Um, the downside is, um, and this is something I haven't heard enough people talk about. But as a as a remote employee, I'm technically putting myself on the same what would you call it um, character, the same genre of employee. As an international, um, because I am now a remote worker, I'm a virtual employee, and it, it is kind of interesting. So as an employee, I can work anywhere, but I'm also now competing with people who are on 20% of my wage. And yeah, look- so that, 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 that dichotomy, it, there's definitely pros and there's definitely cons, and I don't know how it's going to work out, but it's it's some it's some of the trends that I'm paying attention to. Yeah, no worries, Glenn. I'll, I'll, I'll loop back, right? So, um, uh, that's part of it. But that's it's, it's ultra simplistic, to be honest, to to view that as is. And when I talk about people, strategy, execution, and cash, you put cash last. If you've got the right people executing the right strategy, cash follows. Because if it doesn't, you've got the wrong yeah. strategy and the wrong people, right? So, um, I think um for those of people out there, if they become indispensable, and how you become indispensable. Regardless of whether you're remote or or in the office, is you go the extra mile. You you have initiative. You have discretionary effort. You do things without being asked to do them. Now I don't think I don't think being on a screen or not um, does that. But yeah, if you're just bundling on and bundling off, um, and I don't think many people listening to this podcast will fall into that cohort, um, then then yeah, you, you're going to have international competitive pressures. Um, and and by the way, those international competitive pressures have been in other industries. Um, and and you know, a lot of the practices we'll talk to have 
by the deal with accountants who refer to them, they've been doing this exercise since the 80s. So, and you know, you know the reality is, is that um, the role of the general manager and the practice manager is to get people to do their best, highest use. Okay. If you're doing your best, highest use, um, whether you're in uh, you're a CSO or, 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 or a para planner or an advisor, if on a daily basis you're doing your best, highest use, then Cerebus Paribus, you're probably getting paid the most that you could possibly be paid. You're probably the happiest. Yeah. Okay. And if everyone's doing that in a team, you're working together as a team and targets that a team targets are fun targets, you know? So um, we'll be we'll be touching on, on that. Um, and also, um, we'll be finding out new things. Um, I think uh, the there is an evolution um, that I can see around scale, okay? Um, yeah. and, and this is not new. It happened in the, the other professions that we benchmark ourselves against. Scale, um, specialization, um, and the other one is that the the employee of the future is five or six clicks away from figuring out who you are. However, what we one of the I suppose you know when you spoke to me about doing this, and I'm pretty passionate about that, that creating that environment. Uh, I said, well, there's got to be a takeout. There's got to be a um, you know to to get these people's time. Um, yeah. So the practice managers, the general managers. We, as an organisation ensemble, have to be able to say, "Well, this is a, a take up or a follow up." And 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 what we will be doing is, um, at the end of the podcast, when it gets uh, released, um, we'll be uh, allowing the um, the company to put relevant uh, recruitment ads on our ensemble talent hub. Yeah. So, what that means is that that you, as a prospective uh, team member, get to have 30 to 50 minutes of a free interview where you can listen to them. You can figure out if you like who they are before you make that meaningful introduction. Yeah. And it also should filter out the types of people that, that, that they want. So that's our call to action. And if we can just, uh, you know, get the right people working for the right people, then this industry uh, is going to kick some goals. And dare I say it, this industry is about to take off. And that's not just hyperbole because yep. it's fun yep. to be exaggeratory, which is not a word, but Should I thought because I used hyperbole, I'd throw exaggeratory in. Um, <laughs> this is because um, there's tailwinds in our industry. We need lots of new entrants to come in to yep. cover the demand. And if we don't have sort of a, a best practice kind of conversation, then we're going to have the blind leading the blind and we're going to stay a cottage industry. And we just that's just not going to happen. On, on my watch, and it's yep. not, it's not going to happen on Ensemble's watch either here or overseas. Yep. Thank. How does that sound, Clayton? Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. I, this one of the things that's really driven me personally is uh, coming from a, a place in Australia which was very, very small. Uh, you know, and no one really knew anything about about finance. And then, so I moved to the big city uh, after having been in, you know, in a small accounting practice. I then go on to become a financial planner and, and, and launch a financial planning company. And what dawned on me during the process is financial planning is, is just too important to be done poorly. It's too important. Like uh, the, the conversations that I've had with you over the years around, you know, when, when you, you had a massive practice and dealing with a lot of clients and you help them make all these smart decisions around money and you'll buck, you know, even though you individually stopped being the, uh, you know, you became the, the practice manager, you became the GM, right? Relatively, um, early in, in the piece. Um, but you would still bump into clients that were clients of your offices and they would say, thank you for helping me do this because all of these years later, now 10 or 20 years later, they're in a such a better position. And, and I, like everyone who's in advice, we just love that so much. It's not about doing Forex trading for the, a large bank so that they can balance their sheets or whatever. Like it's, it's about real people coming up to you and, and, and it's just, it's so important. And I couldn't agree more that, uh, that, you know, Ensemble's purpose as a company. And then this, this podcast is personally very fulfilling. Well, Clayton, just two points of clarification. The, the closest thing I probably came to Forex was via a tap. 
Um, the uh, the rationale or the the excitement the clients um, might have given me um, post me handing over to other quality advisors might be as much about the happiness that they have of going to a quality advisor. Um, I was uh, I, I did phase myself out to being the worst advisor in there. But I thought, mate, in the, in the time I've got left, I might just do my own call to action. Um, Please. So um, I have a large network of practices, but it is not everyone. Okay, what I've realized over the last couple of years is there's just some cracking practices. So big shout out to all the practices that have come into my world that I just didn't know of and really good quality and we've learned a lot from them. Um, I've, I would also ask anyone out there in uh, who is, who's advising or coaching, I've, I've reached out to quite a few of you to give me your, it's not quite a Hunger Games, your tribune or, or to give me, you know, the people who you admire, um, whether you are advising them or not. Um, and indeed, the people in, in AFSLs or, or, or even in, 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 in product, if you've seen a quality practice, you owe it to the industry to just to, just to pass those details through. I don't mind where it comes from, um, and I'd love to talk to them. I want to get as broad as I can. Thanks, mate. Rocks at Ensemble.com. Cheers, guys. Cheers, mate.